Until now, our equations of motion have dealt purely with motion in one direction, as if we were moving along an imaginary number line. Or we had to consider very simple problems where an object really did travel in a straight line. Now we're going to talk about more realistic situations which happen in two and three dimensions. Things can be moving up and down, left and right, and forward and back at the same time. And our equations of motions extend into this new venue, but we have to do, uh, make some accommodations for how to handle the fact that we're in more than one dimension. Let's talk about a relatively common example because it deals with life here on the surface of the Earth. And that is a two-dimensional motion with constant acceleration. So in one-dimensional motion, we know that constant acceleration led us to get to a certain set of equations for, for linear motion. And that was the equation for a position that y at a function at a later time t would be some initial y naught plus v naught in the y direction times t plus one half a y t squared, where a y is the acceleration in this y direction. There was a second equation, which was describing the velocity at a later time t, velocity would be equal to initial velocity plus acceleration times time. Again, I'm going to continue to put subscripts on all these things to continue to remind us that we're talking about the motion in a particular direction. In two dimensions, we have to use vectors. And so the equations we just wrote become written out as vectors. The velocity vector as a, fun as a function of time will look like uh, three separate functions, each multiplied by the unit vector x hat, y hat, or z hat. So we can either use the notation uh, vx times x hat, vy times, plus vy times y hat, plus vz times z hat, or we can just use the parenthesis vx, vy, vz, but we have to remember that each of these uh, velocities vx, vy, vz are functions of time. Then there's the equation that we write down for the function of time, so it's v naught plus a t, where both v naught and a are vectors, and the equation for position is r of t, which is initial r plus v naught t plus one half a t squared. Just like the velocity is a function of time function, there's going to be a similar function for x of t, y of t, and z of t. So let's imagine a certain example. So let's talk about uh, motion in a coordinate system x, y, and z. We'll imagine that this is near the surface of the Earth, so there's a gravitational acceleration downward, g, which is about 9.8 meters per second squared. That looks like it's only pointing in the y direction, not in the x or z. So as a result, the acceleration that we would use in these previous equations, v of t and r of t, would have an acceleration vector with two zero components and one component that's non-zero. Notice I put minus g here because my y-axis seems to be pointing up and away from the Earth, and g, the vector, is pointing downward, so that's along the minus y direction. Since there's no acceleration in the x or z directions, we would expect the velocities in these directions to be constant because there's no acceleration. And we'll expect that the velocity in the y direction will, cause, will be changing over time because there's an acceleration in that direction. So let's imagine you know, looking at some extreme cases. Let's talk about a rolling ball and a drop ball, and then we'll combine these into something more realistic. So if we were just talking about a ball rolling along the floor and we gave it an initial speed of 10 meters per second, if at time t equals zero seconds it would be maybe at the origin x equals zero and it would have a speed of 10 meters per second. Now this ball has no acceleration applied to it anymore once I've let go of it, so at one second later it would have traveled 10 meters because that's velocity times time and still be moving at 10 meters per second. At two seconds, it would have rolled further, so now it would be at 20 meters down the road, and it would still be moving at 10 meters per second. And three seconds and four seconds, it would just continue to march along at a velocity of 10 meters per second along the x direction, and continue to move along 10 meters per, per second. Notice the velocity doesn't change, and the ball marches forward at constant speed. Let's take another example where we drop a ball from the top of a building. Stand at the top of the building and let go. The acceleration of gravity is roughly 10 meters per second squared, it's actually 9.8, but we'll use 10 as a rough approximation. Then what we would see is at time t equals 0 seconds, we'd be there at the top of the building, so let's say we're at the origin, 0 meters, and the ball wouldn't be moving yet because we're just about to release it, so it has a velocity of 0 meters per second. Because of our equations of motions, once we let go and there's an acceleration of g, and at one second later, our equations for motion tell us that the velocity at one second would be g times t, which would be 10 meters per second, and using our equation for the position as a function of time, the y-coordinate would now be 5 meters. At 2 seconds, 
the velocity would now be twice as big. It'd be 20 meters per second because it continues to grow linearly with time, and the slope of that, that growth is g. And the position equation would tell us that our y coordinate is now 20 meters. At 3 seconds, it becomes 45 meters, and at 4 seconds, it becomes 80 meters. But always, the velocity continues to grow linearly with time. These equations follow the one-dimensional equations of motion. y is a function of time, and v is a function of time. I haven't done anything new here. But let's combine these and talk about a ball that we launch off the edge of a cliff. We'll talk about something where we launch the ball horizontally, so its initial motion is in the x direction. Essentially, we're giving a boot off to the side. Now, in this case, gravity is going to be pulling this thing downward, but there's no force acting on the ball in the x direction. Once we throw it, it continues to move in the x direction with constant speed. So it just continues to march along. The force of gravity in the vertical direction, however, will give the ball an acceleration in the vertical direction. So at one second, it's moving a little bit, and two seconds, it's moving more, and its velocity in the vertical direction continues to grow linearly with time. The actual motion of the ball, though, is achieved by combining these vectors, because the vectors along here represent the x components of velocity. The vectors along here represent the y components of velocity. The true velocity at each of these moments in time, one second, two seconds, three seconds, is at both the x component and the y component. So we have to see these vectors shift around so we can see what the vector addition looks like. So our actual motion looks something like this. It's a parabola. And that's because in the x direction the velocity is constant but in the y direction, the velocity is linearly, linearly growing. As a result, the, the y coordinate of position is uh, parabolically or quadratically growing. So this is exactly the trajectory the ball would follow if we threw it off the cliff in a horizontal fashion.